Indoor air quality is one of the most important and most overlooked aspects of construction for both residential and commercial buildings. On average, we breathe in roughly 2,000 gallons of air a day, according to the American Lung Association. So the quality of our air that we're breathing in and where we're getting it from matters a lot, and there's a lot of conflicting information out there. So how do you ensure good indoor air quality? Well, first off, in order to control air, we have to enclose the air. We need an airtight enclosure to ensure that we're bringing in and exhausting air on our own terms and treating the air that's coming in by means of filtration and dehumidification. We don't want to bring in air through air leaks in the building envelope, since this air is coming from unknown sources, it's untreated, and it can bring with it air pollutants like pollen and dust, chemicals and moisture, and oftentimes it's pretty bad for our indoor air quality. People who say houses need to breathe don't understand that there are differences between air leakage and vapor diffusion and mechanical ventilation, and so it's very important that we define the terms that we are using instead of throwing around these vague euphemisms. Buildings need to be able to dry out and provide the enclosure with fresh, filtered, and humidity-controlled air, and the inhabitants of the building need to breathe, and so an airtight building allows us to have a greater amount of control over the indoor environment and the indoor air quality. We have many videos on how to achieve an airtight building, as well as the different differences between air barriers and vapor barriers, as they're not the same thing at all. Something can be airtight but vapor permeable, or vapor impermeable and leaky. You can go and watch that video up here. So once we have our airtight enclosure, the other part of this is ensuring that we aren't locating stuff that can off-gas chemicals or contaminants or air pollutants within the interior pressure boundary. Source control of the pollutants is critical to good indoor air quality, not the dilution of the air. I'm sure everyone has heard the phrase, dilution is not the solution to indoor pollution. For example, pretend that the food dye in this cup is our indoor air pollutant. I need to add a lot of water to the cup in order to dilute the pollutant, let alone get rid of the color entirely. Whereas if I just remove the source of the pollutant or control it so it's not getting into the air, then we don't have to worry about it. This means that if you're using smelly chemicals or materials, they need to be located on the outside. Paints, coatings, insulation materials, vinyl flooring, composites like MDF, and other finishes can all have a significant impact on indoor air quality, and so the specifications of these materials is really important as a means of source control of indoor air pollutants. Sometimes this means letting these materials off-gas before moving in, or it means avoiding them altogether. We try to opt for as many non-toxic, natural materials as possible, the ones that we know really well and that we've been building with for hundreds of years. Alright, we talked about the importance of air tightness to control indoor air, and source control to prevent pollutants from getting into our indoor air. The last part of this is the ventilation part. How do we bring in fresh, filtered, humidity-controlled air into our building while exhausting moisture-laden stale air? We need balanced ventilation, meaning that we aren't relying solely on exhaust-only ventilation or supply-only ventilation, as these unbalanced forms of ventilation can either pressurize or depressurize the building, which causes air to pass through leaks in the envelope. We want balanced ventilation in the form of an ERV or HRV. These are heat recovery systems that bring in outside air when it passes through a filter and is tempered by the outgoing airstream. So we get built-in heat recovery and comfort since we won't be blasted with cold or warm air every time it kicks on. But the most important aspect of this is that these are fresh air systems dedicated to bringing in outside air and treating it, and exhausting stale air so it doesn't get recycled or re-entrained by the heating or cooling system. And there are tons of different filters that can be used for these ERV or HRV systems, and you can even get HEPA filters for these systems if the inhabitants of the building are quite sensitive to potential air contaminants. And so this is where we want our fresh air to be coming from, not through air leaks. The other part of this is dehumidification. In most climates, we need a dehumidifier to remove moisture from the air and to ensure that we're operating the interior environment at safe relative humidity levels. The thing about these HRV and ERV systems is that they aren't designed to remove that much moisture from the air, and while there could be some incidental dehumidification occurring during certain parts of the year, these systems should not be used as the primary method of humidity control. Ensuring that we're operating at a relative humidity that won't result in interstitial condensation is extremely important to the durability and longevity of our buildings, as well as our indoor air quality. Mold starts to grow on surfaces when relative humidity is consistently above 60%, even if condensation doesn't form, and so we want to make sure that we have a dedicated dehumidifier in place, especially in humid climates like the southeast and northeast United States. Guys, if you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like, and subscribe for more weekly building science videos, and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.